I'm a cardiovascular epidemiologist. I work on pediatric infectious diseases. I focus on prostate cancers and colorectal cancers. I work in the Center for Clinical Trials. I study the dynamics of infectious diseases, so how do diseases move through populations over time and space. I spent 24 years in northern Thailand working on HIV work. Mostly I do infectious diseases uh, in epidemiology, things like malaria, things like uh, schistosomiasis. I particularly look at both the social and economic determinants of chronic disease survivorship. I study primarily aging with HIV, and I'm breaking into a new area looking at children's health. What's amazing about epidemiology is that we can study everything from genetics to social epidemiology and structural determinants of health. And my focus is on the genetics, more on the etiology of disease. The population that I work primarily with is um, people who inject drugs. About 80% of people who inject drugs are infected with hepatitis C, and about 30% are infected with HIV. It's about the people. To me, it's about, it's about the, the people, the population, and improving health. This department is the oldest department of epidemiology in the world. It's a field that started 100 years ago and now has mushroomed and has, has spread through all parts of health sciences in many ways. It's pretty incredible to think that the Department of Epidemiology has stood right here on this ground for 100 years. It started with just a handful of people that were dedicated to understanding and asking questions related to health, and now we stand at over 125 faculty and a vibrant student community. The Department of Epidemiology here at Hopkins is an exceptional place in, uh, in that it is a very diverse place. We have people from very different backgrounds and they all bring unique skill sets in. In my opinion, what makes a good epidemiologist is first someone who's curious about the world and dedicated to science. I think a good epidemiologist is passionate about their research field. We spend a lot of time doing this, so if you're not passionate about what you do, I think it would be very hard to be good at it. I think a good epidemiologist is driven by the desire to understand the puzzle of what contributes to population health. Epidemiology, public health has been called compassion at a distance. I will tell you honestly that the reason that I moved into HIV research and out of clinical medicine is that when I was a resident here, uh, I'm a gay man, my partner was a, an actor, uh, a beautiful young man. He was ill and eventually uh, died uh, when I was finishing my residency here, as did virtually all of our other friends. Uh, I'm a New Yorker originally. Uh, two people, my circle, survived uh, that time. And, uh, and I just felt like I had to make a difference that, uh, that was going to matter and that focused on trying to prevent this epidemic and control it. The work that I really wanted to do was as George Comstock, famous professor of epidemiology here at the School of Public Health, used to say, consequential epidemiology. Epidemiology in which you answer important questions that actually lead to changes in policy or treatment or prevention. Uh, and that's what turned me on to want to come and get formal training in epidemiology before I began my ophthalmology residency. So I started out as um, with an interest in evolutionary biology, so I used to study lizards. My father was diagnosed with colorectal cancer and died in a short time after, so I decided to change my focus to something more human. And I took epidemiology, the light bulb went off, and I was like, this is my home, what a wonderful field, here I am. I spent two years working as a pediatrician in Ethiopia during the Civil War, and that's kind of where I got hooked on global health. The part that I find extremely rewarding about epidemiology is actually the, the creativity and the actual brainstorming of coming up with ideas. I really like numbers. I'm comfortable with numbers. I, I know that those numbers are telling me a story, and that's what an epidemiologist does. It takes those numbers and it helps tell the story about what the data are showing. Any good scientist needs to have a profound sense of the history of their discipline. You know, this was the mother load of both epidemiology training, the development of new epidemiologic methods, case control studies, 
the refinement of randomized clinical trials. So the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health really has its roots in infectious disease epidemiology. William Henry Welsh, who founded the school, did foundational work in infectious diseases and infectious disease epidemiology. Wade Hampton Frost, the first chair of our department, also was a key figure in infectious disease epidemiology and did seminal work on influenza, particularly the 1918 influenza epidemic. He did seminal work in understanding transmission of polioviruses. We study the works of public health giants and how they succeeded in, in what they have done over the years and try to apply it. They used to do these epidemiological studies where they would go and they'd go in the households and they'd track people very, very carefully who contacted who. And we still do some of that today, but in some ways we can learn from the past and how carefully they recorded the information they gathered about families and who may have infected who. And that data, people use it to fit new models of disease transmission today to better understand the 1918 epidemic. I have the syllabus for the first epi course that Wade Hampton Frost taught and it works remarkably like the course that I currently teach. I was very fortunate back in 1984 when I came as a student to meet Abe Lilienfeld. Abe was a chronic disease epidemiologist, perhaps one of the first. I mean, Abe Lilienfeld was a fantastic chair. During Abe's tenure, the department grew a lot. He hired a lot of people. And he actually uh, fostered the transition from infectious to chronic disease epidemiology. For cancer epidemiology, large cohorts have been the source of um, a lot of great information in terms of risk factors for cancer. And one of the studies that we work with was something that was started by George Comstock and is a cohort that's still going on. Our field helped identify smoking as a major cause of cancer. Our field helped identify a virus, human papillomavirus, as a cause of cervical cancer and several other cancers. So we, we bring much more than just looking at whether X is related to Y. Cohort studies are really the, I would say, the gold standard for observational epidemiology. Cohort studies, when you sample people at baseline uh, and then you follow them up, to see who develops the disease. When HIV started, uh, there were Hopkins scientists on the forefront of developing cohort studies that were really critical to understand the disease. Frank Polk was a great leader in uh, establishing uh, HIV research uh, in the Hopkins uh, institution. Frank was a person who, who was a combination of incredible um, talent uh, but at the same time, very compassionate. He created an incredible mountain in this institution where nothing was there. And for him, HIV was not this stigma that you don't touch, it's, it's a problem that we need to face. Our department also has a rich history in terms of teaching. In the early history of our department, we are taught by a lot of individuals in the health departments and has moved into individuals who have had a big impact in terms of the field, like John Samet, Moises Lowe, Leon Gordas wrote the textbook of epidemiology in addition to the research he did. In 1979, Bernice Cohen, along with Abe Lilienfeld, established the first master's program, the first degree program in genetic epidemiology. You know, there are many obstacles to overcome, and but she wasn't a loud, flashy person. She didn't um, scream from the rooftops, but she did it, and she did it in her way. It's pretty incredible to think that 40 years later, we have a, a really growing department. I joined the department in 1957, and the department then was very small, and in fact, the whole school was very small. When I was a student here, the entire department, including its master's degree students like me met in this small room off the cafeteria, which is still there, but it's so tiny you can't imagine the Department of Epidemiology meeting there. We've had great leaders over the last hundred years, and I've been privileged to know many of them. But when you look at the number of chairs we've had, it's not been many, right? Uh, and there's been this thread from the very beginning, you know, from Frost up to David Celentano of, of understanding the importance of methods, 
of, of mentoring, right, of bringing along the next generation, and of coupling those epidemiologic skills to communication and impact. I think the most exciting thing um, in these fields is the treatment advances, um, which is that for hepatitis C in the past four years, there's been a revolution in therapeutics. We have one pill once a day that can be taken for eight weeks that can cure almost everyone who's infected. So the idea that you can cure a one's chronic infectious disease is pretty remarkable. HIV is not uh, a lethal disease anymore. It's changed to a chronic disease. If patients take their medication, be adherent and don't develop side effect, they could have potentially a normal life expectancy. That's a major change. When I started my training, uh, the average life expectancy was 11 months. So uh, that is an absolute sea change. I went to work in a country where the transmission from the mother to the infant, uh, transmission of HIV, was more than 30%. Today, it is less than 2%. The most important advancement in pediatric HIV has been by far the introduction and widespread use of antiretroviral therapy in Sub-Saharan Africa. They really dramatically improved the life and life expectancy of kids infected with HIV. Certainly the, the fact that you know, the deaths from heart disease have fallen dramatically since the 60s or 70s. Well, that's due to a lot of things. It's not necessarily due just to trials, but trials have made a contribution to that, no doubt. There's been so many advances in the, in the field of cancer. It really has accelerated. If I think back to 20 years ago, uh, when I was starting out, we really thought about cancer as this deadly disease, and the focus of cancer research was really on treating the disease. And now, uh, and a lot of this, you know, epidemiology has contributed a lot to this paradigm shift. We're really thinking about how to prevent this disease. The work we did on vitamin A, uh, while there was a lot of material and questions I set out to answer, the important thing was we made an unexpected observation in studies that I conducted when I lived in Indonesia, and that was that uh, children who had even mild vitamin A deficiency were dying at much higher rates than anybody had anticipated. And that led us to do randomized trials, and that established global policy. It's been an incredible experience um, at Hopkins to be one of the people uh, that has helped to show that the HPV virus causes tonsillar cancer and to have that research continue to uh, evolve in ways where we are able to help people with these cancers understand how they got them, why they got them, how the virus is transmitted, and now to work on preventing these same cancers that are caused by HPV. So Baltimore is well known for its markets. Epi faculty in collaboration with our Cancer Center and other departments in the school, have a program at our local market. And they engage with the community. They provide educational messaging about the causes of cancer, about screening for cancer, the need for early detection, and where to go for treatment. And it's really um, rewarding to have a conversation with a community member who was seeking information. Hopkins is just a great place to be. And I think the reason is the people. I think we have an incredible reputation that is deserved. I mean, our faculty are extraordinary, our students are brilliant, and our staff are incredibly supportive. Well, the richness of the people and the research going on, it's just such an exciting place to be. I feel very, very lucky. It's a spontaneous interaction that, that I enjoyed uh, and still enjoy. We have fabulous colleagues who really do want to work together to solve the problem of poor health, poor well-being. There's always a door that's open, someone's excited to talk about science, and it's really a special place to be a part of. Just the inherent curiosity of all the investigators here who 
when something comes up and it's interesting, people say, yeah, go after it. Let's try to understand why. I think there's also a collaborative spirit about Hopkins. I know that although we're a big place, our global reach comes through collaborators that literally span the globe. Internationally, uh, Hopkins can provide the expertise, the leadership, uh, and likewise, we can learn a lot. Epidemiology being that team science uh, really requires you to interact with many different fields and uh, just focusing on uh, the, the data and analysis is, is a very narrow perspective, I think, of epidemiology. I think the Welch Center is really unique in that it's a group of physicians who have training in epidemiology and then a group of epidemiologists who are interested in medicine and clinical research questions, and we all uh, are together under the same roof. The Welch Center has and remains special because it was started by very thoughtful people who mentored very deeply and thoughtfully then combine the rigor of their science with impact on specific policy issues. And we've been fortunate that even when some leaders have left, the next set of leaders have taken on the philosophy, the ethos, and mentored new people who have had great impact. Research has just become so much more complicated that we all don't have the expertise to understand all aspects of the question. When somebody asks, what's the future of epidemiology, I say, it's very bright. So we have the tools and we have the knowledge. Uh, it is, what is changing is probably the environment around us. There's never been a greater need for epidemiology because we're awash in data now. We are undergoing a data revolution in that the amount of data, their depth, and the velocity with which we turn data is becoming bigger and bigger. So it's a challenge for epidemiology to put that together. I'm pretty sure that uh, trials will be around for quite a while. I, I, I don't see trials being replaced by big data. Finding the ways to use the data but not get fooled by the data um, and sort of entranced by the data is the biggest challenge around big data. I think uh, applied epidemiology is going to be more effective, I think, and it's going to grow because that's really the purpose of epidemiology. I mean, epidemiology was created to really resolve prevention in public health problems. So I think we're going to, uh, to be stronger from that viewpoint. I think more and more we'll be doing both um, trial work as well as observational work together. And I think it's going to be, we're going to also recognize that we are more global and Hopkins has that ability because we have international work as well as domestic. And I think more and more all of that work is going to be brought together. We are connected. And uh, I personally believe that we have obligation. And it is good for us that we know what's going on. For example, the field of uh, infectious disease, these are emerging infections. It can be coming from anywhere in the world. My vision for the future uh, of infectious disease epidemiology and in my own work is actually around disease eradication. And uh, as part of my work with the World Health Organization, I'm kind of leading an effort to develop a roadmap for measles eradication. I think the future of my line of research, of physical activity and mobility research, is even going to grow more into the area of what we call EMA or ecological momentary assessment and wearable technology. So this is the combination of what can you measure with a wearable device like a smartwatch or I think we'll even get to implantable devices where people have things implanted under the skin um, and how that interacts with questions that we can ask via text message. So I think one of the biggest challenges going forward um, is related to communication and thinking about how we communicate the importance of our work to others. I think sometimes we assume that there are always going to be departments of epidemiology, but maybe maybe departments of epidemiology in the future are look very different and are more integrative in terms of data science or integrative with other disciplines. I think the field is just becoming increasingly collaborative and working with people in other disciplines and uh, you know whatever debates there are about methods or data sources, I think epidemiologists are the ones that kind of harness those. Predicting the future is not easy at the end of the day. Where I hope it is headed towards is to getting better understanding of what epidemiology can and cannot do. 
And getting that message out to individuals in, in terms of agencies and policymakers, laypersons, so that they can understand the limitations of our field as well as what we can actually bring to the table. You hope that the work that you're doing today, sometime in the future, is going to impact public health, is going to change something. Um, but the direct impact that we get to have is with students. Um, so with teaching, I feel like you get to feel that you are um, having an impact on not only people's perspective, but their future careers, their ability to, to do the same kind of work. The most uh, re rewarding teaching at Hopkins is that expression when a student said, aha, now I understand. That is incredible. Why I feel passionate about training the future epidemiologists is I want them to go into these into these fields and be at the table with the physicians, with the clinical chemists, um, and bring this broad uh, epidemiologic and public health perspective. The new minds help us because they say, well, why are you doing that? Why don't you do it some other way? I, I mean, why? we used to do this. Why couldn't you do that? And you begin to think and you talk more and that's it. That's where a new idea comes from. I think that we bring a lot of different perspectives from different countries, from different experiences that, that make the department a very stimulating and fun place to be. We actually have now is the other danger of mechanically doing things in, in, in computers without thinking what is behind. And that's what we need to teach. Hold it. Huh? You need to be the driver of this. You don't need to be sort of the user of this and let the technology teach you what's going on. No, no, no. Hold it. Huh? Remember, you're the driver. I think we shouldn't forget something that I think is very important. A lot of what we know, and a lot of has been what, what has been applied successfully to public health, came from times when people didn't have those, uh, didn't use those uh, sophisticated methods. We've taken students from here uh, to India because I think it's so important to actually see the population you study. So I think Epi. We think it's about numbers and spreadsheets and complicated formulas and analyses, but at the end of the day, it's about people. Um, and I think your work is better informed by sitting and talking to the populations that you serve. Going forward, our students are going to have to be open to learning much more about a, a larger variety of different issues, whether it's you know genomics or metabolomics, or there's so many omics around for them to master. Um, and it's going to be a challenge. If you're doing trials, you're going to have messes. That's sort of the nature of trials. Messes. And you've got to try to keep the messes from, from driving your ground. And being able to um, be open-minded enough to let the data change your mind. There are a lot of um, knows that you encounter in research or, or sort of paths that may not um, end up where you expect and you have to really care about the answer to keep pushing forward, um, keep moving on to the next question. And try your hand at everything. Abe Lillianfeld years ago told me, you are too diffuse, but I don't think that was right. I think I mean, he, it was coming from a man who was very diffuse. <laughs> he had all kinds of pots he was in. There is nothing more rewarding than understanding something. That is the, one of the most rewarding things that you could have in your life. The ability to understand something and to share that understanding with everybody else. We just have so many stories. And you have to learn about those stories in order to realize how to best proceed forward. Because the basic principles of epidemiology, they may shift, they may grow, they may morph slightly, but they stay the same. It's important to commemorate the 100 years of our department because essentially we need to look to see where we've been to be able to think about where we're going into the future. Reflecting on the past and commemorating 100 years will help us to uh, to look at the next hundred years and help us to find out our identity and be proud of who we are and, and continue our work in the future.